Thank you. So, hi, my name is Susan Perlman. I am the Executive Director of the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition. And I'm here to talk with you today about federal agricultural policy and the incentives and disincentives it creates and how we could do a better job uh, of creating uh, farm incentives. So the current law that we have now is the 2008 Farm Bill. Um, this authorizes $300 billion in spending over the course of 10 years and it expires next year, 2012. So we're looking at a Farm Bill reauthorization in the near future. So all taxpayers help to pay for the Farm Bill and everybody in the country is impacted by the Farm Bill. The Farm Bill impacts how food is grown, what kinds of food are grown, who is growing our food, uh, the well-being of both farmers and farm workers, uh, rural communities and their economic vitality, the environment and natural resources, agriculture has a huge impact in those areas. And as we were talking about in our first panel today, our diets and the public health. So the Farm Bill is clustered into 15 titles and spending happens in different titles of the Farm Bill. And so by far the vast majority of Farm Bill spending happens in nutrition programs. And that includes SNAP, which is an acronym for Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. And there are other nu nutrition programs as well. So that's the huge chunk of money in the Farm Bill. Uh, in terms of agricultural production, the very biggest uh, slice of the pie is crop insurance. Uh, that is followed by commodity uh, subsidies. Next is conservation, and there's a very tiny slice of the pie, and I'm going to put up a slide that shows you how it is proportionally. So here in red is the, the nutrition programs, and then the crop insurance, the commodities, the conservation, and that very, very tiny slice of the pie that you see there in blue is everything else. And everything else includes programs to rebuild local and regional food systems and to help communities. OK, so I'm going to take just a moment to take a closer look at a few of, of, of the chunks that refer to agricultural production, so crop insurance is the dominant uh, way that we fund agricultural production right now through the Federal Farm Bill. Basically what happens in crop insurance is that taxpayers subsidize 60% of crop insurance premiums. In addition, there are 16 private insurance companies that sell these insurance products. We help to pay for their administrative costs. Um, it's a huge program and it has a lot of wrong incentives in it. Um, first of all, there used to be requirements that you couldn't get crop insurance unless you met some very, very basic conservation requirements so that you weren't breaking out native prairie lands, you weren't damaging very sensitive and valuable wetlands, things like that. In the last Farm Bill, Congress got rid of those requirements. So now we, crop insurance is being used to subsidize some environmentally destructive work. Crop insurance, as it's currently uh, planned, as it's currently, as the program is currently uh, designed, increases farm consolidation and it incentivizes monocropping. There is no crop insurance program right now or, or, or uh, product right now that is good for diversified farms, the kinds of farms that grow fruits and vegetables and the kinds of farms that mix grain production with livestock production. And it's ironic that there is not, no such product because diversified systems are actually better from a risk perspective and insurance should be all about reducing risk. And I just want to give one quick other example of ways that the federal crop insurance program uh, provides a really important disincentive. Insurance, uh, excuse me, organic growers have to pay a 5% premium on the crop insurance that they purchase. But if they have a loss, they only get paid out at conventional, not organic prices. So next I'm going to talk about commodity subsidies. And you, you may have read a lot about this in the newspaper. 
first of all, the, the important point is that most farmers do not receive commodity subsidies. The commodity subsidies go primarily to five row crops, and these are corn, soy, wheat, cotton, and rice. And a lot of this production is not actually for food that is consumed directly by humans. For example, a lot of the corn produced goes to ethanol, and also corn and soy in large part go to animal feed. So it's not the kind of corn that you and I would be eating at the dinner table for the most part. Now, um, it used to be a safety net. So the commodity, commodity program was originally created as a safety net. However, it's no longer that way. So that farmers get paid out under the commodity program even if commodity prices are high. And they get paid out even if they are in a large farm and a wealthy farm. And they can get paid out even if they are not actively farming. 10%, the top 10% of commodity program recipients receive 63% of commodity payments. And that means that some farms are receiving hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars. And uh, there are disincentives in the, commo in the, com in the, in the commodity program um, for uh, production of fruit and vegetables on these row crop lands. If we were to cut the, the uh, commodity subsidies, we would save $5 billion per year. So those are, some, those are some programs that have some disincentives built into them or some bad incentives and some disincentives that are a problem. However, there are a lot of programs in the Farm Bill that the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition supports. Um, and these are some of them. So, so one of the slices of that pie was conservation programs. So conservation programs like the Conservation Stewardship Program, um, it encourages farmers to be better stewards of their land, and it rewards those who go the extra mile to do things like conserve soil, reduce water pollution, protect wetlands and wildlife habitat. This is the kind of incentives that we think that the Farm Bill should be promoting, and yet, despite that, uh, conservation programs have been repeatedly the targets of federal budget cuts. In addition, there are other programs that were in that very tiny blue slice of the pie, like the Farmer's Market Promotion Program. Uh, this is a program that, that, among other things, helps SNAP recipients uh, use their, their, their vouchers at farmer's markets so that they can get fresh fruits and vegetables. Now, the Farmer's Market Promotion Program and many of the other good programs up here uh, have no baseline funding. And what that means is that in the next Farm Bill, they are not assumed to continue, that we would have to find, farming, find funding from somewhere else in the Farm Bill in order to continue these programs. And there are other good programs up here, like programs that provide research on sustainable agriculture, training on sustainable agriculture practices for farmers, uh, programs that help to revitalize rural communities and programs that help to rebuild local and regional food systems. So under our current federal agricultural policy, there's a disconnect. So the USDA comes up with dietary guidelines and they have an advertising program called My Plate. And if you look at the advertising program, they're recommending something close to 50% of our food consumption could, should come from fruits and vegetables. However, in the Farm Bill, there's a disconnect and the policy is not doing a great job of promoting fruits and vegetables. In fact, in the Farm Bill, fruits and vegetables are referred to as specialty crops. <laughs> um, if we wanted to produce here in the US the amount of fruits and vegetables that have been recommended for the American public to consume, we would have to add 10 million new acres of fruits and vegetables, and we would have to add between 25 and 40,000 new farmers. And so this all brings us to the question of what is going to happen in the 2012 Farm Bill reauthorization. And I cannot speak about that topic without first talking about the super committee. 
So folks may remember this summer there was a very heated debate about the debt ceiling, raising the debt ceiling, um, highly politicized and highly controversial. It was in the news every night. On August 1st, Congress passed a piece of legislation called the Budget Control Act. And this uh, Budget Control Act created a 12-person super committee made of three Republicans and Democrats from each the House and the Senate. And I'll note while we're here in Massachusetts that Massachusetts Senator John Kerry is a member of the super committee. So this, this debt ceiling deal uh, tasked the super committee with developing legislation that will cut somewhere between $1.2 trillion to $1.5 trillion from the federal budget over the next 10 years. They have to develop this piece of legislation by Thanksgiving. It's going to be submitted to Congress for an up or down, no amendment vote. If Congress does not complete this entire process, and pass this, this law under the Budget Control Act, we go into sequestration. And sequestration means that there will be pro rata, across the board cuts in funding over the next 10 years for the federal government. For the farm bill spending, what this means is a $15.5 billion cut under sequestration. So the, the committees in Capitol Hill that have authority over the Farm Bill are the Agriculture Committees. So here is a map of the Senate Agriculture Committee. Senator Debbie Stabenow of Michigan is the chairwoman of the Senate Agriculture Committee. And this map shows where the other folks are located geographically who are on the committee. You can see that the West Coast, by the way, is not well represented. Uh, this is the House Agriculture Committee. The House Agriculture Committee is chaired by Frank Lucas of Oklahoma. And again, uh, all of the members of the committee are shown there on the map. So on Monday of this week, the leaders of the House and Senate Agriculture Committee sent to the Super Committee a letter saying that we will submit to you by November 1st, which is about a two week turnaround, um, legislative language that will cut $23 billion from the Farm Bill. And that's basically where the Farm Bill reauthorization process is. This is unprecedented, by the way. We've never had a super committee of this kind. Um, and it is going to change the game in the Farm Bill completely because it's going to dictate the funding. Um, if they can pull it together, which you know, a betting person would bet, it would be pretty hard for them to pull it all together. But even if they don't, the fact that the agriculture committees are now talking about making massive cuts to Farm Bill spending uh, is, is, will impact the rest of the Farm Bill reauthorization discussion. So, <clears throat> so, you know, I mentioned at the top of my talk that we are all, tax, as taxpayers, we're all paying for the Farm Bill. As consumers, we're all affected by the Farm Bill. So it makes sense that we would all have some role in being engaged in the Farm Bill. So, you know, if you care about having programs for sustainable agricultural producers and for consumers, it makes sense that you would want to weigh in with your members of Congress. And so I do recommend that you follow the action happening in the super committee and in the farm bill. That's particularly important if you have, as, as folks here in Massachusetts do have, a member on the super committee, uh, members on the House and Senate Agriculture Committee, and also the House and Senate agriculture appropriations subcommittees. That's basically where all the action happens around this cluster of issues. And so you can email, call, and write your member of Congress uh, weighing in in favor of moving away from direct subsidies, uh, having insurance programs that help diversified and organic farms, um, Retying crop insurance to basic environmental and conservation requirements. Putting meaningful payment caps on, on all the programs, including the crop insurance program. And then supporting the great programs that are there to help beginning farmer and ranchers, uh, socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers who have had a history of discrimination by the USDA. Uh, programs that do great research and training around sustainable agriculture, 
programs that revitalize rural communities and programs that uh, rebuild local and regional food systems. So in addition to writing and calling, you can also go to visit your member in their district office or if you ever make your way to DC, you can visit them in their DC.